Fallout Season 1 is now on Prime Video, and in honor of that, I am joined by none other than Bethesda's Todd Howard, who is an executive producer on the show, and Jonathan Nolan, who is an executive producer and director of the first three episodes. Welcome, guys. Thanks so much for joining me. Oh, excited to be here. And I'm, I'm so glad we get to talk now, post-release, because I feel like people have been binging it over the weekend and discussing it in earnest. Uh, do you guys keep up with the reactions and reviews and fan theories? Or are you kind of purposely staying out of that a little bit? I mean, it's I keep up with it. You know, it's hard not to read all that stuff. And everybody's loving the show. So when you're getting uh, all this great feedback, it's pretty much, you know, it's a lot of fuel. All the credit to Jonah, Graham, Geneva, everyone who worked on the show. It just turned out, uh, you know, we're so happy. Jonah, I, I'm curious with you, too, because I don't know if you, like, got burned out on Reddit theories during Westworld or what have you. <laughs> you want to get it. It's always gratifying when people are enjoying something. That, that's really exciting. But I think you have to be a little careful because if you read too much, it, you know, it could even subconsciously start to steer, steer the ship a little bit in different directions. So I think I've dipped a toe in it uh, and everyone seems to be excited, which is great. That's very gratifying. Yeah, well, I'll probably be the thousandth person to tell you, but the show rules. <laughs> it's great. I've watched the whole thing. And uh, uh, Jonah, you've talked about how you're a big Fallout 3 guy. Uh, can I kind of ask you for your history with the series? Like, when did you start playing? How many hours have you lost to this series? <laughs> uh, I started Fallout 3 shortly after it was released, which I think is 2008. I wouldn't feel good about putting a number on exactly how many hours I played that game. But it was a lot. It's a big game in your defense. It's a Bethesda game. So, <laughs> and Todd, you've talked about how you were, how you said no for years to a follow adaptation um, until Jonah came along with his pitch. Now that we can actually talk spoilers and talk details, I'm curious if there was any like specific detail or specific hook in Jonah's pitch that made you think, oh, this guy gets it. Well, when we first talked first, I was such a fan of the work that he had done both in the movies um, and in television with, with Westworld. And when we first talked, it was, you know, I wanted something that would stand up as another entry in the series, as opposed to retelling one of the games we did and sort of treat it like we do a game and move the timeline forward and do some great things. And, you know, that's what he was thinking as well, which is like, hey, what's our ability to tell a new story? TV is about, you know, finding the characters and, and how do we get the tone right in the show? So all of our initial conversations were around mostly tone, right? We know we're gonna tell a new story, but I think the trick with Fallout is the world itself and how you go between all those different tones that the games have. And I thought, you know, the show does that really, really well. Yeah, you definitely have that like kind of weird Fallout humor that is very specific to Fallout. So you definitely see that along with like the kind of the darkness of the world as well. And Todd, of course, you're coming to this as kind of like the lore master. I'm curious if when you went into the writer's room, if there were if you had to correct a bunch of stuff or were they already like they, they knew their stuff when you came in? They really knew their stuff. I'll tell you what, everybody behind the show it's one of the things that you wish people could see. Well, I think you see in the show, right? Mm -hmm. In terms of the passion everybody involved in it brought to it. From Jonah to Graham and Geneva, our showrunners, the actors, the whole cast and crew. When you would go, I would ask people like, are all TV show sets like this? Like, well, no, you see them all come together. And the people that were even, you know, cameramen who were Fallout fans. And so obviously we were there from the beginning to help sort of guide, to make sure things were, you know, in line tone wise and other little bits of fiction and other things but they were they were so all over it and wanting to pull things from every game from fallout one to three to new vegas to four um there's even some 76 stuff in there and i think it's one of the really wonderful things that it does if you're a fan of the series and everybody has kind of their favorite entry that you can see bits and pieces of that in the show and Jonah, this show takes some very large swings with Fallout lore, and you're no you're no stranger to big IP. You've done Batman, obviously, but was the, was there anything where you were like, "Is this too big a swing? Am I taking too much liberty with the lore here?" Well, I think you want to approach it from a place of of, of humility when you're dealing with, and and this is has been just a, a dream collaboration. I mean, the the partnership with Todd and the rest of the amazing folks at, at Bethesda and the support there and the openness to our team with, with Geneva and Graham to be able to get in here and, and do some real storytelling. I think that the, the part that was the most exciting 
but also the most nervous making were all of the flashbacks. And it was something that when we, as we were talking about it and Geneva and Graham were getting more and more excited about telling that story about what happened before the war, what precipitated the war, where, you know, one little sliver of that larger story and a little bit more uh, of an insight in vault -Tac. That was the place where I was both the most reliant on talking with Todd and the team over there a lot about, okay, you know, let, let's make sure that we don't, that, that all of this fits, fits together, plays nicely with all of the rest of the, the lore. Um, but the ability for the show, which is something a show you say, you know, wh wh why even make a show out of a game? The game has so much, so many, you know, so much flexibility. They're so big. They're so epic. There's so many choices you can make, and you're you're removing a lot of that openness with the series. But the series can do things like flashbacks that are a, a little more challenging with the game. So that world, that world before the war, which is so distinct, so satirical, so it, it's so much of the the flavor of these games, and the ability to play in that, I think, was was incredibly exciting to us. And given that this show is telling kind of an original story, but it's still so, so, so loyal to the world of the games. I mean, was there any pushback on, you know, making a show that was extremely loyal to the lore and art design of the games? I say, every, look, every time we do a game, we want, we want to push the story forward as well. We're looking at things and how do we add. And so the show does that as well. You know, as they had story elements that they wanted to do, it's like, Oh, that's really interesting. Let's find a way to make that work. You know, Grandma Geneva wanted to blow up Shady Sands. The first thing they bring that up, you're like, what do you want to do? <laughs> I need to like, you know, I had actually an emotional reaction to it, given the history of that location in the franchise from Fallout 1. And we talked through it and it was, this will be a pretty impactful story moment that a lot of things anchor on. So, so making that work. And just so people here and I know are watching this, like, we're careful about the timeline. There might be a little bit of confusion in some places, but everything that happened in the previous games, including New Vegas, happened. Um, we're very careful about that. And so when they brought that up, you know, threading that needle uh, to make sure that that was a moment that landed in the show that also moved things forward in terms of what's going to be happening in the world of Fallout. Um, that, that was a big one that we talked about. Well, I was actually specifically going to ask you about that Shady Sands timeline conversation. And you say that, you know, nothing in, in New Vegas is retconned. Uh, I think the rub to kind of TLDR it is that the fall, quote unquote, of Shady Sands happens in 2277, which is fall, four years before New Vegas. So was that just like, are people just misunderstanding what the fall of Shady Sands means or like anything like that? All I that? can say is like, yeah, we're threading it tight there, but the, the bomb falls just after the events of New Vegas. Like that's when Shady yeah. Sands blows. So basically the like, fall of yeah. Shady Sands, yeah. It doesn't mean a nuke necessarily. Correct. I'm glad we got that out of the way. <laughs> that was a big question. Um, we are, we are, look, we are tight on the dates mm -hmm. if you really want to get into it. But that, what's important is when the show takes place, what is happening in the time period of the show. And that's mm -hmm. what's most important to us. Absolutely. And that kind of brings me to this question of you could have made this show in a way that, say, the MCU does, where the where the movies are separate from the comics. Why make it intertwined with the lore of the games? Well, it definitely is is harder to do, right? Mm -hmm. We just felt as fans of Fallout, that would be the kind of show we'd want to watch. Um, and the things where we think the world of Fallout is going in the future. And it's also, look, for me, I can't say enough about the job. Jonah and the whole team did on this in terms of, I love to work with other creatives that are going to bring a lot of new things to it. And as Jonah was referencing what they were able to do in the past and vault -Tec, and there's, there's even more. I just thought, look, as a fan of Fallout, it's an absolute delight. From our end, we had seen the care with which Todd and the team at Bethesda had made sure that all of these games connect together. Everyone worked on Fallout, all the games, we're so respectful and so careful to keep this consistent universe. If we got a different direction, the show would be the only thing that doesn't fit with that universe. And obviously, there's challenges there. These are open world games in which some of the games have, you know, you know, the games all have different endings, different outcomes, and you have to honor, you have to find a way to, to honor those. But we didn't want to be in our own little private corner of an else world or a different universe. That felt like I think that would be less meaningful to me watching the series to know that it was completely divorced from the reality of the games. From what I have heard from you guys, though, it's more so that being intertwined in the universe is more of an asset than an obstacle. Am I am I right? I think it's de definitely more of an asset. It is a challenge. I, I mean, as Todd said, it would be, you know, be much easier for us to just kind of like a bull in a china shop 
just go in here and pick whatever we wanted. And in fact, I've worked on annotations before where they're defined by the degrees of difference from the source material, where you're adapting a book, when you're adapting, you know, for instance, Westworld, the original brilliant film by Michael Crichton. I mean, it, you know, the, the series shares the ethos of that film, but very few, uh, very few of the sort of story moments. Sometimes it's about making changes. Sometimes, and, and it's always more difficult to thread that needle of respecting all of the lore, respecting all the great storytelling that's come before you and trying to find a way to not only play nicely with that, but also add to it if you can. So like I said, just a, just a dream collaboration. Uh, I wanna dive into kind of this main trio of characters of Lucy, Maximus, and uh, Ghoul or Cooper. Um, and we'll start with Lucy. I, I found it so refreshing how she is this very optimistic character and you kind of expect throughout season one for her to take a turn but she never does. Like she gets tougher, and but she still remains essentially the Leslie Nope of the Wasteland. I'm curious if that was always the idea or if there was ever, you know, a, a, a thought where she might get a little more cynical. I think it's one of the things that we really enjoyed about Geneva and Graham's pitch for these characters from the beginning was that, you know, there would be the ability to grow. And I think change is always a possibility there, but there would be certain things that these characters would really hold on to sort of essential pieces of their character. I think Lucy is such an essentially such a likable character in part because her idealism is kind of unchallenged when it starts. And then as the story continues, you see what are the things that in this kind of, you know, in the crucible of the wasteland, what's she going to discard and what's she going to hold on to? And her essential decency is something that I think, even when she's tasked with making some very difficult choices, even when she's tasked with taking a life, I think you still feel that decency underneath it. And I, I think that was a, a really exciting choice. Yeah, and she really goes through it throughout season one. And I think you have this big reveal, of course, that about her father, Hank. I mean, is he basically our big bad now? You have to stay, stay tuned and see. And we love working with Kyle McLaughlin. What a, what, a, what a treasure that guy is. God, he's so good. And moving on, you know, I saw a take that was... Uh, the three characters are kind of perfect embodiments of the D and D alignment chart. Like Lucy is good, Maximus is neutral, and uh, Ghoul is evil. And I really love thinking about Maximus as neutral because a lot of his choices, I feel, come from just naivete. Uh, what are you kind of trying to say about the Brotherhood of Steel as an organization through this character? For me, I just remember that moment where they offer to let you let you join up. <laughs> Can I go? I'm not, I'm not quite sure what I'm. You know, are we in like a Paul Verhoeven Starship Troopers kind of moment here? Like, are we, <laughs> this, do we feel good about this organization or bad? I mean, the helmet looks cool. You want to wear that armor, right? And, and I think for me, Max really represents, you, you know, my experience playing these games where, where I'd like to think that, you know, I play through it with, with Lucy's moral virtue. But the truth is there's some moments where you just want the big gun. You just want the kick-ass armor. And you're trying to figure out how much you're willing to morally compromise yourself. I think Aaron Moten just did such an incredible job of portraying that neutrality, that kind of, you know, that, that ambiguity of, of which way he's going to go. And, and, and that's how it should be. Look, you see it, you see this guy, when, they, when the, the airship comes and they come walking out, just like, it's completely badass. I mean, there's no other word to be like, I want to be post-apocalyptic Iron Man tank. And then, you know, how compromised morally am I going to be? Are they, who are they out for? And I really love a lot of the scenes where, you know, them teaching technology or how they treat squires. Um, the thing I definitely want to borrow is I love, I love the solve for how all of these weapons are carried around with the giant golf bag. <laughs> so if, if I had like a wish, you'd see that in the game like 76 really soon. But there, there's so many great parts about the Brotherhood of Steel in terms of what the wasteland can mean. And so I, I think Max often is, is the player. Like, would I have done that? Is he making the right choices? So, and I think Aaron, Aaron pulls it off great. He does, he absolutely does. And I also find the dynamic between Lucy and Max to be so interesting. I mean, in your guys' opinion, are they like actually in love by the end of season one or is it essentially like a marriage of convenience? Like you're here, I'm here, why don't we love each other? No, I don't, I don't think it's a marriage of convenience. I think there, there's a genuine bond there. Their, their backgrounds are so different and yet they've they've found this space in between where they relate. No, I think there's a very genuine level of connection there. I just, you know, in the way of all things, there's a little bit of comedy, there's a little bit of tragedy in the show. So we'll see if they can if they can find each other again. Speaking of tragedy, I think we have to talk about Walton Goggins and Ghoul, who has just been a breakout character without a doubt. Uh, first of all, the most obvious question is: Is Cooper Howard named after Todd? <laughs> no, no comment. 
Fair enough. And I, I think one of the coolest lore reveals is that uh, he's kind of Vault Boy, or at least Vault Boy is based on advertisements that Coop did. I mean, is that kind of where the character started? We had conversations with, with Graham and Geneva and, and Todd talking about that lore and backing into it. We, we just love the idea of Cooper. You know, when we knew the show was set in Los Angeles and the kind of ruins of Hollywood, the idea of Cooper as this figure embroiled in a kind of a Red Scare McCarthy-like moment in this bizarro alternate future was was kind of too delicious for us to pass out. Because here we are, you know, again, the, the Hollywood Hollywood assholes coming to adapt this beloved video game franchise. And there was a, a meta satirical level that we just that we just thought was delicious. And then of course this this question of how far is too far in terms of actors or writers or anyone in terms of that corporate sponsorship, you know, sort of going down that 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 rabbit hole. So I, I think picking up the mantle of the satire from the games and trying to direct it back towards Vault Tech was one of the most exciting things that we got a chance to do. Yeah, absolutely. And Coop is a great way to do that. And uh, I'm curious, like kind of how, what kind of balance was there in kind of the, I would say more morally compromised uh, ghoul that we see and trying to also hold on to ho who Coop was 200 years ago. It's an ongoing story. I think that's what, one of the things that's so fascinating about these characters. He's seen the whole story and you, you so seldom get a chance to, you know, to, to write a character with this kind of span where, you know, in, in flashbacks, you're talking, you're looking at someone who I think from the first frame, you understand is decent. You know, he makes some mistakes and, and he's certainly got, you know, he, he learns some things along the way. But I think we understand from his first interactions with his daughter, this is an inherently decent person. And then we see what the, the rack of time has, has done to him. And it creates this chasm between who he was and, and who he is. And I think it's just a, a fascinating thing for the show to explore. I think by the time you get to the end of the season, you understand this is a there's a person who's, who's capable of evil, capable of ruthlessness, has seen enough life come and go that, that life is truly cheap to him. But I think there is still a, a question of what drives this, what what is driving this person, what has been driving this person for, for these hundreds of years. Absolutely. And, and you kind of have this great uh, line drop in the finale with both Barb and Coop saying war never changes. Was it important for you guys to have that line in there in a prominent role, given that it's kind of in certain ways the ethos of Fallout? Graham is an even bigger fan of Fallout. I would say a bigger fan, but a, but a longer standing fan. He's been playing since the very first game. And so we talked and they talk, Graham and Janina talk endlessly about the right moment for that line to land. I think a lot of people would expect to see it in the very beginning of the series. I love the way they kind of Casino Royale it. They sort of, you know, and the, one of the beauties of that film is that you wait the whole film to hear that distinctive John Barry guitar sting that announces that, you know, that Bond, Bond has begun. I think there's a, an opportunity to take that line and use it to kind of plant a flag here that, that hopefully our story has just begun as well. Staying on the subject of, of Coop, uh, you have this huge reveal in the finale that Barb kind of betrayed him. And it, from my perspective, it's a pretty evil decision. She was one of the architects of, of the nuking. Um, are we going to get an answer for that about, is there going to be some kind of justification to kind of save Barb? I don't know if you'd say there's a justification, um, but we're very much hoping to continue telling that story. That's going to be my answer for all these questions. I wish Graham and Geneva yeah. were here, but they would say the same thing. Again, those flashbacks, that storytelling, those characters, those actors was so much fun for us. And I think if we're lucky enough to continue telling the story, that will definitely be a part of it. And I'm curious how you guys see the NCR as it stands now. Like, is it is it demolished or is it kind of more like the Minutemen where it's just kind of fractured? One of the takes that we always have is to is to approach things very locally when we're doing Fallout. You know, we're careful about saying what's going on in other parts of the world. And we always take this view of like communication is difficult. And look, if you look at the the background, the NCR is is a wide ranging sort of organization and group across not just California, but other places. So the show focuses on this period of time and this group here. And that's, you know, that's what we can say right now. But I don't, I don't think you've heard the last of the NCR. Absolutely. And I'm sure we haven't heard the last of Moldaver. Again, question that will probably be answered in season two. Are we going to find out why she's been around for so long? Because we didn't find that out in season one. We did not, did we? I think uh, I, I, would, I would love that. I would love to, to spend a little more time. Yeah, Sharita is a lovely, lovely human being, fantastic actor. And, and I think uh, picking up that story would be great fun. All right, I'll take a break from grilling you guys about the lore and ask you about some of the BTS. 
Uh, for all the people that we did see, I, I loved like the Matt Berry cameo. That was great. I was a little mm -hmm. surprised not to see Mr. Ron Perlman in the show, given that he has such a big role in the games. Was there any talk of, of bringing him in? There are so many treasures in these games that I think, you know, uh, uh, some of the characters, some of the factions, some of the locations, we didn't want to try to tackle everything in, in one season. So again, a question I would leave up to, to Graham and Geneva, but I, I like the, the pace. There, there were moments in which you sort of say, okay, pace yourself. I mean, I think one of the reasons why Todd and I, in that very first conversation, recognized that this had to be a series was because the scope of the games, each individual game is, as we, as we said, you know, 50 to 100 to many, many more hours of gameplay. There's so much storytelling in each of these games that we knew from the beginning a movie couldn't possibly encompass all of it. Even one season of a series couldn't get close. So there's been a mantra from the beginning, uh, you know, and again, with, with fingers crossed that, that everyone loved the show, we get a chance to keep going. I think a mantra with Geneva and Graham that we sort of, and conversations, a lot of conversations that we have, we say, you know, you pace yourselves. Right? You're not going to try to tackle every single part of this universe in one go. It's a big universe. <laughs> with, with, and, and speaking of celebrities who are fans of Fallout, uh, have you heard from anyone since the show came out who's like, hey, I love Fallout. Was it, why wasn't I in the show? Can I be in season two? <laughs> <laughs> we've, I, we've been hearing from so many people. And it's kind of fun to see the Fallout fans kind of come, come out of the woodwork. People you've known a long time and you kind of realize, oh, you, you've been playing this whole time. So it's been a lot of fun. Are you going to get your brother into Fallout, Jonah? <laughs> <laughs> or is he into it am i wrong we, we grew up playing games together um but mainly when we get together and i think most of the gaming that he does these days is just cooperative stuff with me occasionally but we both had kids he's got a lot of kids and i got lots of kids and now they get to play the games i think the last game i played with chris was uh was was probably uh rock band with his kids it's a good one. I love it. I still have the drums and the guitar in my apartment. You know, it brings a family, it brings a family of uh, of talentless musicians together. <laughs> and uh, Todd, I want to switch gears a little bit uh, and ask more about the games. Uh, we obviously know that Fallout Five is in the works, um, but you have said in the past that it's the plan is Elder Scrolls Six and then Fallout Five. Is that still the plan, or is there any chance that that could change based on the interest from the show? I'm going to avoid putting dates on anything. I've learned that the hard way. So obviously, you know, our focus as far as uh, new development right now is, is Elder Scrolls VI, but that doesn't mean that we're not making plans for other things. We're still doing a lot of work, uh, obviously, on Fallout 76. And uh, we see the community, so many people going into that game and kind of rediscovering it and just so happy with where that, that game is at. And it really does, and I mean, this has one of the best communities in all of gaming, like surprisingly, it's like a very, very nice apocalypse. <laughs> and we're doing a lot of Starfield work as well. So we have some really good updates that are, uh, you know, gonna get announced soon for that game. So a lot, a lot going on here. And to press you about the future now, Jonah, and I, in the past, you've talked about, you know, kind of wanting to finish Westworld and having this, you know, plan for it. I'm curious if you and Graham and Geneva have this multi-season plan for Fallout, or are you kind of still, like, feeling it out? No, we talk it through. I think, mm -hmm. you know, you have a responsibility when you undertake one of these journeys to have a bit of a plan. You'd also be foolish to not account for the things along the way. That's one of the beauties of television. You'll start working with an actor who maybe came in for, you know, a, a little cameo and then, and then winds up becoming a, you know, a key part of your universe. That's happened on every show I've ever worked on. So you, you want to have a plan, but you also want to be flexible enough to, and adaptable enough that you're not locked into that. And, and for, the, for the obvious reason that, you know, it, it, especially these days, you know, with these shows, you want to make every season as, as great as you can. We approach it more now from the perspective, the same place we approached a, a film franchise, where you try to make a terrific season. And if you're lucky enough to go again, you, you make a, you make a follow up, you leave enough material and you have enough of a, of a master plan from the beginning that you know what the next step would be. And I, I uh, we have been, we have been talking for some time now about the next steps for Fallout, and we're very excited about it. Well, I, for one, very, very much hope we get to see it. And I don't know where the time went, but we are out of it. Uh, thanks, you guys, so much. Uh, guys at home, Fallout is now on Prime Video, season one completely streaming. Uh, and, and Todd and Jonah, thanks again for joining me today. Thank you. Thank you. This is awesome.